Man, it is so good to be with you tonight on this very wet Wednesday. Um, I don't know why it always rains on Wednesdays, but it seems like every Wednesday it rains. And uh, but I'm glad that you are here and you're with us, and we're gonna um, we're gonna dive back into uh, the book of James tonight. And uh, and uh, Josh, thanks for um, for the encouragement. Uh, he said I only had one more step to go. That that would be a lie. Um, I got a lot of steps to go, and uh, but I'm grateful for your prayers as we go down this road of ordination. And uh, so it's quite an adventure. And so keep praying. And uh, I was telling my wife a couple weeks ago, it's probably easier to be confirmed as a, a Supreme Court justice than it is to become a pastor in the United Methodist Church. Um, don't tell Jamie I said that. Uh, so, uh, um, but um, so, so it's good to be here with you tonight, though. And, and like I said, we're wrapping up this conversation that we've been having in the Book of James, and and I really hope that uh, that you've been kind of taking some really great stuff out of uh, out of James. And um, you know, the reality is that we've only kind of like scratched the surface in the Book of James. Like we could spend probably a half a year on the Book of James because there's so much stuff packed in this little book in the Bible. And um, so I want to just encourage you to keep reading it. Maybe go back and start it. James 1 and start all over, Um, because you'll see, man, we didn't talk about that, we didn't talk about this, we didn't talk about that. There's a ton of stuff in the book of James, and it's so good, and we just kind of picked one out of each chapter, and so um, so I just encourage you and challenge you to go home, read it, study it, write down your questions, uh, email me questions, email Vicky questions, email anyone questions, say, hey, I really want to know what that means, or I'm struggling in this, what did James mean by that? Um, Because I just think it's such an important book for us as believers. Now, I said that word believers because I want you to know that the audience of this is, is, a, is a church, and it's, it's believers. And so James is writing to a, a bunch of believers. Now, if you're not a believer, if you're just checking the whole church thing out, or maybe someone dragged you here tonight, um, don't worry, because I think you can kind of pick up some great stuff and some great nuggets out of this book as well, because you, you can, if anything, you'll say, well, that's what you're supposed to be like as a Christian, you know? I mean, if anything, you can like hold us accountable, and so when we start doing things like conflict last week and we start like burn, you know, start kindling the fire of conflict, you can say, oh, remember James chapter four when he was talking about conflict and his believer, you know, you really shouldn't be having that conflict with one another. So if you're not a believer, just use it as ammo against us. It's okay. I mean, that, that would be good. Uh, some of us need that. And, uh, and so tonight uh, we're going to keep doing that. But before we do, next week is a kind of an important week in the life of the church and uh, it's called Ash Wednesday. And Ash Wednesday kicks off a season called Lent. I know you're like, what is all this stuff? Ash Wednesday kicks off a season called Lent, which is the 40 days before Easter, not including Sunday. So if you like count back 40 days, you're going to be like, Rick, it's more than 40 days. You're right, because you can't count the Sundays. And so it's 40 days leading up to Easter, and it's a time of preparation for the Easter season. And so Lent's a really, really neat time in the life of the church. Like for me, I'm like, Lent is way, I mean, Christmas is really important. Don't get me wrong. Like Jesus, birth of Jesus, Big deal, but Lent's a really cool season in the life of the church, and uh, and I love it because it just kind of helps us think through and get prepared for Resurrection Sunday. And so um, Ash Wednesday kicks it off next week. So I want to encourage you to come. It's, it's Generation Sun, uh, uh, Wednesday night. So everyone's welcome here. And uh, so the kids will be in here. Kid, kid table kids will be in here. We'll provide nursery. Don't worry about that. But everyone will be together. And we're going to worship together. And we're going to figure out and find out and discover together. What's this thing about Ash Wednesday? And what's the deal with the ashes on your forehead? Come next week. Find out. I would encourage you to even do some research before you come. Maybe have some table talk with your family whatever that looks like, and say, hey, let's, let's talk about this before we go into it so that you might even be a little more prepared when you come in. But Ash Wednesday next week, don't miss it. And we got two options. Uh, we'll have the table option, and then we have a, um, a traditional service that's happening at Limona at 6.30. So you can pick whichever one you want. We're not like tied down to one or the other. We're not like, uh, we're not going to beat you up if you come here, and we're not going to beat you up if you go to the other one. We just want you to go and experience Ash Wednesday. So whatever one you feel more connected to uh, would be great. And so, uh, but tonight we're going to talk about James. And uh, to kind of get into James's frame of mind, um, I, I want to tell you a story about a guy uh, in Los Angeles. Now, this man in Los Angeles, California, he was arrested, and, and he was arrested for, get this, negligent discharge of a weapon after shooting his toilet into pieces. 
So what happened is he shot his toilet five times with a 38 caliber handgun. 911, someone called the police. They came, true story, and they arrested him. And he claims that he just got upset and he couldn't take it any longer. Now, the background to the story or the context of the story was that his daughter had flushed her hairbrush down the toilet earlier that day, clogged the pipes, the thing wasn't working, he couldn't get it fixed, and and I don't have any word on the toilet's condition, but I think it's pretty safe to say that this man's patience is long, long gone. Now, I think about that, and I think tonight, how's your patience? Like, how is it, how do you, how are you working in the patience department? And uh, how's that thing? Is it spread thin? Is it like one more thing and you're going to blow? Are you going to grab your handgun and start shooting the toilet to pieces? Or do you have like the patience of Job where you're just like, bring it on. I'm good. I'm rolling. I'm all right. How's your patience? Because doesn't it seem like today... I mean, reality is this, and it seems like today that there's always something trying our patience. For me, ordination, trying my patience. Right close second, school, trying my patience. But there's always something. I mean, it seems like we're always like waiting in line for something. Uh, we, We wait on traffic. We wait on lines at the grocery store. We wait to hear about that new job. We wait to finish school, or we wait to retire, or we wait to be ordained, or we wait, uh, we wait to uh, for that decision to be made, or we wait for someone to change his or her mind. Every day gives us plenty of opportunities to be training in patience. And we can do this. We can hate waiting. I hate waiting. We can hate waiting. We can accept it. And we can even get good at it. But one thing is certain, that we cannot avoid waiting. There's always going to be a line. There's always going to be a traffic jam. There's always going to be something that we're waiting on. So tonight, James really wants to talk to us about patience. So if you have your Bibles, I just want to encourage you to open them up with me. We're going to look at James chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 7 uh, through 11 together. And so uh, let's just go ahead and let's just read that together. It'll be on the screen for you if you don't have your Bible. It says, uh, James says, Be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it, receive, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So in this passage, James James is really addressing uh, the issues of what we all face um, when problems kind of overwhelm us, when life gets like sideways and crazy. And James is really talking about, he's saying, hey, I get it. We're tempted to lose our patience. And we are, aren't we? I mean, today you probably can like name a couple times where you were tempted to lose your patience. And a lot of you are shaking your head. So I'm like in good company. I feel good. I feel better. And, uh, and maybe you're, you're also tempted to lose your perspective on what's going on. And oftentimes we're tempted to blame others for those moments when we lose our patience and our perspective. And so let's look at these. First, James says that we're tempted to lose our patience. And if you look at with verse 7 with me again, it says this. It says, be patient. Everybody say, be patient. Be patient. Like we can stop there, and that's pretty much the rest of the book for us. Be patient. And he goes on, though, and he says, therefore. Now, the therefore we'll talk about in a minute because he's addressing what took place in the verses right before. He says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for his precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it 
until it receives the early and the late rains. And then the beginning of verse 8, what does he say again? You also be patient. And so here James is really setting the theme for the whole section with this command. And it's a command that he gives us right up front. And the command, we know it. It's in fact, he states it twice. One in verse 7 and once in verse 8. And it's be patient. And to give you that little context of that, therefore, uh, if you read and, and the, the ones of the verses previous to this, James is writing um, and, and to the people and they're experiencing a tremendous amount of difficulty and persecution. How many of you all had a hard day today? Like, duh, I mean, we all have hard days, and uh, maybe not today, but maybe tomorrow, or maybe yesterday. And, and James is like not, he's just saying, he's talking to this church that's experiencing some persecution and some hard times. Because if you read back in the first six verses of James 5, you see that the rich folk were oppressing and persecuting the Christians. But James is like, hey... Brothers and sisters, he's kind of like, you know, in churches, and, and a lot of Baptist churches, they call everybody brothers and sisters, like Brother Rick, Sister Jen, and, and uh, so he's like, brothers and sisters, he's like, check it out, uh, they'll get theirs, don't worry about it, be patient, don't worry, and he's like, therefore, be patient, he's just like, don't let them bug you. Don't let them get under your skin. Remember, he talked about the judge is waiting on the other side of the door. He's like, don't worry about them. Be patient in bearing the offenses and the injuries of, of others. Now, now, James, again, like I said, he's speaking to believers. And we know this because he says the whole brother-sister thing. Not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. In four verses, he says brothers and sisters. And, and this is the this patience that he's talking about can only be achieved by a person whose life is connected to God. Like he's saying, here's the deal, guys. He's like, if you're not connected to God, you're not going to have this kind of patience. Like everything's going to probably get under your skin at some point. But he's like, if you're connected, if you're a brother and a sister in Christ, then you're going to have this kind of patience that I'm talking about. And the word that he uses comes from a combination of two Greek words. Now, I didn't learn this in school. I, someone else smarter than this told me this. And, uh, but the Greek words are this, makros, which means far away. And the second Greek word is thumos, which means anger or heat or rage. And so this word... It's not like a it's not like a passive patience like I'm just going to I'm just going to take it and I'm just going to sit here and I'm just going to let it kind of hit me and and woohoo you know it's not that kind of passive sitting on the couch waiting for it to happen kind of patience but it's like this attitude of self-restraint that enables you to refrain from the nasty retaliation that you want to give. It's like you're active in this, in this, this, this uh, overcoming of whatever this thing is that's coming at you. You're like, I'm doing all my best. I'm doing everything I've got to keep myself from saying something that wouldn't be a brother and sister in Christ. Like, I'm going to keep my mouth. I'm going to do it right. I'm going to keep it wholesome. We have a saying at our house, like, we're going to stay on the, on the curb. We're not going to get into the gutter. We're going to stay up on the curb kind of thing. And, and, uh, and so it's this, this active self restraint. It's this attitude of, I'm going to be patient. And patience, if you look in, in uh, Galatians and you read about the fruit of the Spirit, you see that it says, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. So you see, patience is one of those markers of being a believer. Like, if you're a believer, if you're living in the fruit of, of the Spirit, then you've got this thing called love, and you've got joy, and you've got peace, and you've got patience exuding out of you. And, uh, and so it's one of those things that just sets us apart as believers. But patience, don't worry, it doesn't come easy, does it? Like, it's, it's work. we got to work at patience. We all have experienced uh, the hurt of mistreatment from others or a misunderstanding. Um, and, and they come in a variety of, like, those, those hurts, they come at us in all kinds of directions. Like, sometimes it's, a, it's an intolerable work situation. Man, that wears our patience thin. Like, oh, if i got to go to work one more day, like, I'm going to explode because if the boss says one more thing, I'm, I mean, I'm going to lose it. Or maybe it, it might even be fights at home. And maybe, maybe it's mom and dad 
and maybe uh, you're just you're really they're they're working on your patience and uh, and they're giving you plenty of opportunities to to exercise patience or maybe your spouse is giving you plenty of opportunities to exercise your patience whatever it is and and so it might be home or maybe it's maybe it's difficult relatives mother in laws um, that that are out there no I'm just kidding I'm just kidding I really am I, I'm just messing with you seeing if you're paying attention but um but maybe. But maybe it's not in my house. Let me just say that. It's not in my house, but maybe it is like relatives and that are really testing your patience. Or maybe it is uh, people who are taking advantage of us. Or friends or so-called friends who turn their backs on us. Or neighbors who believe um, crazy things about us. And, uh, and dozens of other hurtful, painful circumstances. And when these hurts happen... You know what our natural tendency is. I mean, you know where we want to go is that we want to retaliate. We want to return evil for evil. We want to get even, right? I mean, that's what we want to do is we want to get even or we want to hold a grudge and we want to get, we want to become bitter. I mean, we want to go to that place of bitterness and live in the land of bitterness for as long as we can because that's how we're going to get even. We're miserable. The person that did the harm to us, they're fine, but we're miserable. And uh, that's where we want to live. Like, that was my response. When my dad was killed, he was shot and killed, I wanted to go to that place. I went to that. I didn't want to. I went to that place of bitterness and of anger and of resentment. And, uh, and my patience was so thin in that time. But there's a better way for us to respond to such hurtful circumstances. And James, as the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, he reveals this to his congregation. He's saying to the church, he's like, church, I love you. I'm crazy about you. I want you to be all that God desires for you to be. And he says, so here's the deal. When suffering comes, when you're, when you're feeling the heat of suffering or of abuse or of, of, um, of, of ridicule, he's like, be patient. He's like, wait patiently. And then he says, why? He says, because Jesus is coming back. Three times in these three scriptures, three verses, James reminds us that Jesus is coming back. You see, that's the hope of the Christian life, is that Jesus has not left us here. He's here with us now and partially and He will return in the fullness and the glory of God on one day that we don't know when. And it's going to be amazing. And James is saying, hey, I know it's rough. I know it's tough. I know you're struggling. But don't give in. Be patient because Jesus is coming back. Jesus goes on to, or James goes on to give an illustration of patience when he says, look at the farmer. Like, we're like, farmer? What are you talking about? Like, maybe we know strawberry fields, but, but he's like, he's like, see how the farmer waits? And every one of them are like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. We do that. We wait. And, and the farmer is patient because the value of the harvest justifies the wait. Like, we got to be patient and wait for the harvest. And when the seed is planted and everything is done in the initial stages, um, the farmer, he doesn't, like, take a vacation. He doesn't, like, climb up on the front porch and say, okay, I'll see you in six months and take a nap. No, the farmer goes and continues to work in other areas of the farm and prepares for the harvest. And while we're waiting on Jesus' return, we don't like put on white robes and go climb up on the church roof and wait for Jesus. I mean, that's, we don't do that. But what we do do is we get busy working in the church and winning people to Christ. That's what we do. And some of the greatest missionaries of history faithfully spread the seed of God's Word and you know what, though? Many of them had to wait long periods before ever seeing one person come to Christ. Uh, William Carey, for example, he labored seven years before the first Hindu convert was brought to Christ in Burma. In Western Africa, Africa it was 14 years before one convert was received into the Christian church. Patience. Be patient. The word patient means to endure under. And you don't really need patience when everything around you is going well, do you? But you certainly need it when life is going rough. 
And suffering and patience, they kind of seem to go hand in hand with one another. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about hard times working patience in us and gives us opportunities to express our patience. James gives us two examples of why we should be patient. First, there's the example of the Old Testament prophets. And he speaks of them in verse 10. He's like, James is like, these guys have given us examples of needing patience when you're mistreated. Like prophets, man, I would not want to be a prophet in the Old Testament because you were going to either get beat up or killed or run off. One of those three. Like it was guaranteed and they knew that. Like you go to that town, you're either going to get beat up, you're going to get killed, or you're going to get run off. One of those three things. And they had to have patience. And God honored these prophets by using them, but he never guaranteed them escaping persecution in this world. And then uh, you see second the example of Job in verse 11. James is like, church, remember Job? Everybody's like, oh yeah, we remember Job. Oh yeah, Job, Job, Job. And James is like, we need patience when we don't know why life is going sideways. Like Job, you, you probably are familiar with Job, but here, let me read you what he says. He says in verse 11, he says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and mercy. You see, Job is this great example of endurance because uh, in the face of all this unexplained suffering that Job was experiencing, he is a memorable model of endurance under tremendous suffering. Suffering. Like he had it all. You know the story. He had wealth. He had a wonderful family. It seemed like he had everything he ever could have desired. And then suddenly life gets sideways and he loses it all. He loses his property. He loses his possessions. He loses his family. He loses his health. The only thing he had left was his wife and his own life. And his wife said, Why don't you just kill yourself and get it over with? And Job did not understand what was happening or why, but he knew that his life was in God's hands. Even in the confusion, he cried out to the Lord and he knew. You see, Job is a wonderful source of encouragement. He knew his life was in God's hands even when he didn't understand what was happening or why. My daughter, just the other yesterday, she didn't make the uh, the flag football team. And, uh, and, and she just, she looked at me and she goes, Dad, why, why? like, because she didn't win a, the Bloomingdale Idol. And she's like, why, why are these things happening? As only a, a freshman could ask, why are these things happening to me? And I'm just like, baby, you just got to be patient. You just got to hang in there and be who you are. Because that's what Job did. He didn't understand why. He just kept hanging in. And when we are tempted to lose our patience, can I just challenge you with this? Remember that it will be worth the wait. And secondly, we're tempted to lose our perspective. And so when we are, we have to strengthen our relationship with the Lord. We've got to strengthen our relationship with the Lord. In the second portion of verse 8, James utters another command. He says this, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. That phrase, establish your hearts, that's a weird phrase. What does that mean? And he says that instead of feeling agitated and shaken up by life's circumstances... We need to develop an inner sense of stability. And, uh, and James is, I think, charging us to patiently, uh, as patiently waiting Christians, to firmly establish our hearts in God's word and truth and strengthen ourselves against sin and temptation and the trials of the world. You see, strengthening your heart has to do with supporting something that is heavy. And so when you're feeling the world, the weight of the world coming in on you, we got to strengthen our heart. When wrong has been done against you, your heart is heavy. And so we got to make sure that we're working it out and we're ready. So to strengthen our hearts is to strengthen our relationship with God. And strengthening our hearts requires prayer. Strengthening our hearts requires attention to the scripture. Strengthening our hearts requires fellowship with one another. And those are just a few things that strengthen our heart. You see, when you're tempted to lose your perspective, you got to strengthen your relationship with the Lord. And then finally, when you're tempted to blame others, you have to remember that grumbling doesn't help. That's what James said. Verse 9, Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. You see, Impatience with our circumstances leads 
to impatience with God. And that often leads to impatience with God's people. You see how that works? And what do we usually do when we begin to feel the heat of our circumstances? We begin to complain and grumble to anyone that will listen. And oftentimes we lash out at each other because of the pressure that we're feeling. And in verse 9, James issues that command. And he says, grumble not. You know what that means? Translated what that means? Stop grumbling. And so James knows us so well. And he knew of our tendency when facing opposition or injustice. He knows that our tendency is to lash out to those that are nearest to us. And he's like, man, church, don't do it. Don't do it. He's like, look, Christ may return at any time. And he is literally standing at the door. And he may open the door at any moment and walk in. So he better find you waiting patiently standing firm and not grumbling against him or one another. So the next time you're tempted to lose your patience, remember that it will be worth it in the end if you wait. And when you're tempted to lose your perspective, rekindle your relationship with the Lord. And when you're tempted to grumble, just don't. Let's pray. Father God, thanks uh, for the book of James. God, thank you for your servant, James, who gave us some great words to think about in life and how to live our life in practical ways. Father, you've given us so much to think about from, uh, from sticks and stones to not comparing ourselves with others to not being in conflict. God, there's just so many things that you've taught, taught us in this book. And Lord, there's so much more to learn. God, my prayer is tonight for each and every person in here is that we would, we would learn to, um, to grasp the gift of patience. Because, Lord, it truly is a gift from you. And Lord, help us to share that gift with others in the way that we treat you and the way we treat one another. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>